Hi, and welcome to this edition of the NOFAS webinar series. My name is Andy Katcher. I'm the Communications Director at NOFAS, the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. And we have a great webinar for you today, um, presented by Deb Evenson. And just a brief introduction of Deb Evenson. She is an outspoken advocate for those living with FASD, also is a master teacher and a behavior specialist with more than 40 years experience teaching children, adolescents, and adults. And she's been a pioneer in discovering practical solutions that work for individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and brings a unique perspective of one who has spent thousands of hours helping to find solutions within schools and communities across North America facing FASD. And Deb Evenson has a great presentation on students with FASD, simple strategies for behavioral and academic success. So in a moment, I'll turn the presentation over to Deb Evenson and the presentation will run for about 45 minutes or so, and uh, we'd like to leave about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for questions, and we'll go until about 3 o'clock Eastern time. So people, uh, feel free to send your questions at any time. Uh, given the content of this webinar, there may be a lot of questions, so definitely the best chance that you have for making sure that your question is answered by the presenter during the webinar is to submit your questions as early as possible. So you can send your questions as soon as you think of them, and then after the presentation, I will come on and I'll audibly uh, ask uh, the questions out loud to Deb Evenson, who will then answer them audibly uh, at the conclusion of her presentation. And also just want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and a video recording of this webinar will be made available within 24 hours after its conclusion. And you can find, you'll be able to find that recording by going to our website, www.nofas.org. That's nofas.org. And you can click on a button on the homepage that says webinars. And then you'll see a link to uh, view the recorded webinar. And we'll also share that on our social media profiles, on our Facebook and Twitter account. Uh, if you're not already connected with NoFast, I would definitely encourage you to connect with NoFast on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can find those links on our website, nofast.org. And also encourage everyone to sign up for the NoFast Weekly Roundup. It uh, comes out every Monday and has the latest news and information uh, in the FASD field. Um, in terms of research updates and personal stories of people living with FASD and news coverage, media coverage of FASD. So uh, you can sign up for that a weekly roundup, a weekly email newsletter, also by going to our website, nofast.org. So at this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Deb Evenson. Thank you so much, Andy. And thank you to everybody, all of you wonderful people who are taking the time to talk about these students that we all care so much about. Uh, students living with the prenatal, uh, with the effects of prenatal exposure to alcohol, and <clears throat> I'm calling you this morning from my home office in Homer, Alaska, where we're all very grumpy because we've just had our first snowfall, which means winter is probably here. So <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> you you folks will brighten my day today. So we're going to talk about the children with FASD, who are our educational systems canaries in the mind in the mine. They're the most complicated, vulnerable students in our system. And <clears throat> working with them, some of the, uh, the, a lot of the, the approach to working with them is really quite simple once we understand how their brains work differently. Dr. Philip May, who is a leading researcher doing surveillance uh, statistics in the world, says that 2 to 5 percent of all children in the United States uh, have an F fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, uh, diagnosed or not. And uh, there's some indication that he's discovering it may be even slightly higher. So you might want to follow Philip May and his research. So that's a lot of students. Here in Alaska, and I, always, I put the Alaska um, map, I apologize for this, over the lower 48 states, just uh, because people often don't know how big the state is. But in Alaska here, 5%, and we assume because we have such a high number of students living with this disability, that we're at least 5%. So the, one of the largest school districts in the United States is in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, they, we assume there 5% of the population, there would be 2,500 students with that disability. And on the Kenai Peninsula where I live, and I've been doing a lot of work in the school district that takes this area, we assume that there's 450 students. So we're talking about a large population, bigger than autism, 
bigger uh, than our other disabilities and that somehow is a system where we've been missing. What currently happens to students with FASD? In early childhood, they often do the best they're ever going to do in our system. And what happens then is that often people think with a little more help, a little more uh, time, they're going to be able to catch up. And it's a, it's a big mistake to not get a child a diagnosis of an FASD because it may not matter when they're um, with perfect parents and a perfect kindergarten teacher, but I guarantee you it will matter when they're 35. So it's important to get an early diagnosis because in the, our middle elementary school uh, years, often about third grade, we start seeing a big difference, a big gap in uh, the performance of students with FASD and their peers. A gap in understanding often looks like sometimes um, Teachers say, does the student have attention deficit? Are there problems at home? Are there behavior problems? Because the world starts getting more abstract. And our kids with FASD have a hard time, can't keep up. By middle or junior high school, when things get even more abstract and uh, more transitions, et cetera, they start falling through the cracks. And currently, we're losing most of them by high school. And um, by losing our students to our system, we're losing a treasure because they have much to teach us. Students with FASD have much to teach us. But currently, through our lack of understanding as a system, hardworking teachers working together uh, uh, with parents are leading our students with FASD to the edge of a cliff. Because the very most difficult time for them is um, adult life, early adult life. So the basis of all this is uh, said well by Stuart Whitley, who's the Minister of Health and Social Services in Yukon Territory in Canada. He said, think of the unjustness of having an affliction where you appear to understand more than you do. That's fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in a nutshell. That statement, appear to understand more than they do. So let's just talk for a minute about a typical school day or a vocational training day and why it's such a struggle for students with FASD. Because it's based on learning theory that assumes students can process information in a consistent manner. It assumes that if you have an IQ of a certain level that you understand um, um, the behaviors and things uh, with, you understand life at that level. Okay. But students with FASD don't process information in a consistent manner, and it causes lots of problems. Learning theory assumes the student is capable of learning a rule or a principle, um, let's say recess, uh, behavior at recess, understanding the underlying concepts of that principle, the reasons why, why it makes sense to behave that way. Remembering these concepts, remembering from one recess to another, or uh, one activity to another, and then being able to generalize this learning to many different situations. In other words, it assumes that people can process information, taking in it, in information through our senses, linking it to what we already know, storing it, and being able to use it in a consistent manner. People with fetal alcohol can't process information in a consistent manner. It's a really big deal. Sounds simple, really big deal. Because prenatal exposure to alcohol actually causes the brain to be built differently. It happens from early on in pregnancy. Uh, it affects the layering of the brain, the way the cells go together to form the brain. It affects alcohol dissolved cells. It confuses cells. It builds the brain differently causing, and there's a lot of information out there on the physical causes to the brain of exposure to alcohol, but one of the biggest is the corpus callosum, and it affects, this is a typical corpus callosum. The rest of the, the pictures on this slide, have the children have all been prenatally exposed to alcohol, and you can see this corpus callosum is missing part of the, part of, um, 
part of it is actually missing, and then these two here have a genesis or missing corpus callosum. Um, and the highest cause of that is prenatal exposure to alcohol. The corpus callosum is a bundle of fibers that connect the right side and the left side of the brain together. So it helps us understand the deeper meaning, link ideas together, make sense of everything from school rules to how to be, uh, behave on the, you know, at home. That's a big deal when your brain can't do that. <clears throat> and unfortunately, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences often compound the problem because many children prenatally exposed to alcohol also experience child abuse, child neglect. And that level of stress uh, adds to the brain damage that happened before pregnancy when a child experiences stress on this level after pregnancy. And all children coming into foster care have experienced this level of stress, for example. Uh, when it becomes toxic, it, dis it disrupts the architecture of a child's developing brain and affects how they deal with stress. So excessive stress programs the brain and stress hormones to overreact. They're super, super sensitive and overreact to stress. So let's take all this information together and look at how that affects a child in, uh, in the regular activities in the classroom. These um, are PET scans. That the areas that are lit up show the area of the brain involved in seeing words. Let's say the teacher writes some words on the blackboard, um, on the board, and this area of the brain is involved in the child seeing it, and she, the child listens to the teacher talk, and yet it's another area of the brain. And then the child's an, uh, developing, generating words for it to answer a question is yet another area of the brain, and then answering the question is yet another one. So if you see it's the connection between the parts of the brain um, that is disrupted by these brain damages. And information processing deficits mean difficulty with abstract reasoning, generalizing information, ongoing problems with memory and time, and of course that brings anxiety and frustration and issues with socialization. The problem in our schools often is information processing deficits may look like oppositional behavior when we don't uh, take the time to really observe and when is not un recognized and understood. Key Warner, um, who I think is an absolute genius, um, developed this um, one night, to, uh, late at night, to explain to some people the next day at a presentation um, to try to help them understand uh, a child that they were working with. And she's um, watch Key Warner because she's going to be publishing some of this, and there's a lot more really good stuff out there. So she said, um, these two circles, um, <clears throat> this circle on the left uh, is the student with, represents the brain of a student with FASD. The circle on the right uh, represents a, a neurotypical or a typical student. And she says, that to, just to understand the colors on, that she chose were just the colors she could get to work <laughs> in her computer late at night at home. The blue is going to stand for a brain at rest. And the area of the brain that's involved um, will be shown by the color. Yellow is a brain more alert, and red is full-on uh, focused. Okay. So here's these two students sitting in a classroom. Teacher gives an instruction. Three plus five equals. They both hear the instruction. Look at the brain on the left. There's a lot area involved, but it's still at rest. That student is trying just as hard, or maybe harder. The one on the right, the brain just hopped right to it, is more alert. And then there, the brain on the left, you can see that more area is involved, it's trying to find the answer. The brain on the right is fully alert, sent a strong signal out, found a connection, Calc and calculating. It's already calculating, just like that. That's how that person's brain works. The student with FASD is still sorting the words, but look how much of the brain is involved. Look how hard the brain is trying. Now watch what happens. This brain, the neurotypical brain, is finding the answer. 
brain on the left, the student with FASD, is still processing the words. But look how much of the brain is involved. So the teacher is repeating the, repeats the instruction. Oh, I want the answer, please. Give me the answer to 3 plus 5. The brain on the right has it. He is sending out a cord, I mean a, a connection for writing, writing the answer on the paper. The brain on the right is then finally fully alert. All look at the area of the brain that's involved. Maybe the child is counting on fingers, often kinesthetic movement. We often do that just naturally um, when we're we're figuring out math. Now look at the difference between the two brains. <clears throat> So at this point, see the student's written, the neurotypical student has written the answer and his brain is starting to relax. The brain on the left, the student with FASD, is fully alert, fully working, much harder, but hasn't quite found the answer. Another repetition. What's the answer to 3 plus 5? The brain on the neurotypical student is returning to resting, maybe starting to gather his materials to go out to recess or thinking about something else. The student with FASD is still translating the fingers to number symbols, finding the numbers, finally picking up a pencil. Now I've had teachers observing this with a, with a student here with FASD at this point saying, just focus, you're not trying, your brain is wandering, your mind is wandering. None of that is happening. This child's brain is fully involved. So now he's picked up a pencil to write the answer, searching memory for it, and as we all know, students with FASD have ongoing problems with short-term memory. So they could possibly go through all of that, pick up the pencil, get ready to write it, and it's gone. The answer's gone. The teacher says, 3 plus 5 equals what? And the student with FASD may have to start at the beginning if the answer isn't there and go through all the steps. Calculating, finally the brain is able to calculate the answer and writing it. But I want you to look at how much of that brain is involved and how much of it's on full alert. So this is the reason why a lot of our kids with FASD, this, this is what a daily, uh, you know, solving one problem is like in a classroom. And this is why it often seems like they have a, a low level of frustration. It's really not. Look how much that brain's been involved. The other student's out playing at recess. And then that, when your brain is that involved, it takes a while for it to calm all the way down. So by now, the teacher may be on to another program or another activity, or they're all out at recess, so he's missed part of recess, and then finally resting. Okay? It doesn't go all the way down either, as you notice, because it was that involved. <clears throat> By not Sue Hempel, who is Morgan Fawcett's grandmother, and I have a lot of respect for her and the work she's done with him, she says, by not paying attention to the very specific brain-based differences of individuals with FASD, our education, social, educational, social service, mental health, and legal systems are trafficking in children with FASD. By using the techniques that work only with their secondary disabilities, such as mental, emotional problems, uh, uh, etc., and not taking into account the fact that the brain actually works differently, um, that's what she means by uh, that we're just trafficking in them. Because she says we lead them from school to jail by, by dealing with um, just the secondary disabilities. <clears throat> so what are we ignoring as a system, as a school system, a mental health system, social service system? What are we ignoring? We're ignoring the fact that a brain that it works is that complicated and has to work that hard 
it takes longer for that brain to be cognitively mature. It takes longer for the child to learn the typical learned patterns of behavior that get us through adult life. So their problem solving age or their social age is, well, let's take a look. Um, Dr. Ed Riley did a study several years ago looking at the social and emotional age of students, and he looked at students with full FAS in this study. And um, he looked and compared the social and emotional or problem solving age, real life problem solving age, uh, compared to their actual chronological age. And he compared a typical student, he said, a neurotypical student, I would say here. Let's say a student of 10 years old um, has a social problem solving age of 10 or maybe a little less than 10. That's a typical student. A typical student with a lower IQ but without FASD the, the has a problem solving age. Here you can see of 10, uh, maybe this one is a, a little under 8, but it's going steadily up. The, child with F, the children with FASD, the problem solving age is half or less than half their chronological age. And it takes a much longer time for them to, to uh, grow up, basically, cognitively. The Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale is a really good, it's kind of the gold standard for working with kids with FASD or students that have learning and behavior uh, consistent with those of um, students with FASD. It gives, when we have a developmental age for the student, then it gives us a place to start. That's the key. That's the key that we're missing in our system. Let's just take a look. And this is an old one, but um, some of you have seen it. I'll go really fast. Let's look at chronological age appropriate versus developmental age appropriate. Let's look at a typical five-year-old. They can go to school, follow some instructions, cooperatively play, share, at least some of the time, right? And all of that, take turns. A typical child with FASD might be five going on to problem solving wise. So if I have a student in my kindergarten class with, with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or with a, a known his, a history of prenatal exposure, and I look at these things, parallel playing, very active, uh, want things their own way, like a typical two-year-old might act. If I found that person acting like a two-year-old, I would say, oh, good, right on target. Because what happens if we try to get a two-year-old to have the wisdom and understanding of a five-year-old? It doesn't work, does it? And so we start developing secondary problems. We need to know what success looks like at the different ages. It goes all the way up to 18. Let's say a typical 18-year-old is on the verge of independence, getting ready to plan their own life. Um, Sort of, right? <laughs> a neurotypical 18-year-old. Well, a typical 18-year-old with FASD might be 18 going on 9 or younger, even with a high IQ. And so when we understand that, we see, let's think if we took an 8 or 9-year-old, stretched them out to look 18, shot them full of hormones, and sent them in the adolescent world, what kind of issues might we have? Exactly the issues that we have with our students with FASD. I like to say that our adolescents with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, I quote Barb Weibrach uh, from Michigan, uh, who calls them stretch toddlers. If we work with them at their developmental age, we get different outcomes. We have to get children with FASD to their mid-20s instead of just 18. And I know that that brings some system problems <laughs> that a lot of our systems are starting to struggle with. And uh, this is knowledge ahead of the system, so uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but they have to because often the 18, 19, 20-year-old time is the toughest time in the life of people with FASD. Because we have, and if we give them till like 25, when the frontal lobe of the brain goes through this immense, well, your brain goes through an immense growth period, and uh, the frontal lobe develops. If we can get our students with FASD with support around them, whether it's the school system, 
home, community, church, whatever, to, to 25, we start seeing different outcomes. But, so when we work with a student with FASD at their developmental age and give them time to, to co grow cognitively mature, to become cognitively mature with support, we avoid the cliff. We have different outcomes. We're starting to have many more different outcomes, more positive outcomes with these students. So there's four questions. If I, as a, as a teacher, I, I, I still work with many schools, school districts uh, throughout North America, with, and I'm doing some uh, pretty big projects with a couple of districts here in Alaska that have been going on for several years. When I'm observing students, the things that, that, that I have the teachers do is find out what the student or client or child's developmental age is get an adaptive behavior score. If you don't have access to a, uh, adaptive behavior testing or you can't do it, then assume it's half or a little bit less than half their age. Because I've never met a student with FASD that that didn't apply for, it for and I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. So <clears throat> I say, what is my student's developmental age? And would this behavior be more normal or more typical if that was her or his actual chronological age. And then I say, what is it that the student doesn't understand? Whether it's a recess, uh, an academic problem, um, a language, a social, uh, what they, using the appropriate words, whatever it is. What is it that they don't understand? And then how can we, using a dot-to-dot -dot approach, step-by-step -step approach, help develop habit or learned patterns of behavior that the student can accomplish the task or learn the skill with or without a current deeper understanding, with or without the insight. We, we focus on what, not why. And years ago, Jan Lutke and I developed, uh, came up with these eight, eight magic keys. They're simple, they're almost silly. But if you look at them, there's two C's, two R's, and four S's. And it's how we avoid crises with students with FASD. It's so simple that um, it seems almost silly. And it works. Let me just tell, give you, let's go through these. By the way, NOFAS has a, um, a video that you can order from them on the Eight Magic Keys, which is an animated video developed by uh, a think tank of master teachers in Anchorage School District. And I think it's really good. Um, so kind of explaining this more. And we have another school district that is um, working on one with showing actual teachers in the classroom in real life situations. Okay. So the eight magic keys. Let's go through them. <clears throat> Number one, be very concrete or literal. Um, sometimes, often, especially as the students get get older, you know, as we become more abstract, when you really listen to what what we say, how we talk, we use idioms, we use what, words with double meanings, um, and students really have a difficult time. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, at about a grade three, we start seeing a big difference in our kids with FASD in the system. So <clears throat> be very literal. Say exactly what you mean. And for me, this can mean um, there's some ways you can do this. You can give the student uh, the, the steps just written very simply. Um, you can use a little bit of sign language. Sign language is very literal. Um, and that can help. Um, and But we say exactly what we mean. Um, for example, there was a girl I worked with several years ago. Her name was Sally, and she had had some behavior problems, but had been doing better. And in, but in grade four, she came to school and just refused to talk in the classroom. And the teacher would ask her a question, and she would purse her lips together and just sit there. Now she would talk out on the playground. She would talk at home, 
the teachers thought it was incredible oppositional behavior, and they put her on point charts, and she just simply refused to do it. And they finally, in conversation with the parents, uh, and the com and the and the child, the child, they learned that the child's uncle had come that summer, right before school started, and had given his his favorite niece a very stern lecture about behavior at school. And she, he made her promise that she would never, ever talk in class. And she took it literally and was just doing, you know, she took it literally. So you'd think a fourth grader with an average IQ would figure that out. But that's an example of not understanding the deeper meaning. Okay. So two, consistency. Be very consistent. There was a student I worked with a couple of years ago who, I've worked with students with emotional behavior disorders for many, many years before, uh, throughout my career. And um, so I've worked with kids on the street, I've worked in uh, prison programs, I've worked in psychiatric hospital programs, so I, I have a wide range of background. So when I say the most violent student I've ever worked with, I'm really saying something. This was a student who was, um, at the time, he was 11 years old. He had broken teacher's jaw, a broken teacher's jaw, injured other teachers, destroyed classrooms, destroyed his home. So I'm talking extreme violence. And he had, um, they had been in and out of psychiatric hospitals and uh, for his behavior. And he had a diagnosis of FASD. And of course, he had many compounded. They'd given me many other diagnoses. The teachers I was working with there, um, I'd done a lot of training on FASD, and they they sat me down one time and said, "Can we? What do you think about just applying, you know, um, that consistency and these eight magic keys to him in a very, very step-by-step uh, -step way?" And we started. This is what they did. They started. Uh, they took him out of the classroom and started teaching him what to do every every throughout the whole day and were very, very consistent. The teachers, this is just an amazing group of teachers. And they said the same words to him. They uh, said, this is the rule for walking in the classroom. This is how we do it. And taught him how to walk in the classroom. They taught him step by step as if he were three or something. Now, I don't mean they talked down to him. They didn't do that at all. They just taught him step by step what to do. After um, they started this program in November, and um, by between November and May, the child had, and I wouldn't believe this if I hadn't been part of it and seen it, he had zero outbursts. Zero. Now, you can't do better than zero. <laughs> he developed a friendship for his first ever. He was integrated into PE classes his first ever, and he started having a life. The teachers were astounded at the difference. He also got lots of nurturing. At the end of in, in May, when I visited his class, I could come in and interrupt what he was doing, telling him a funny story, and then he would go back to work again. That would never have happened before. Number three, repetition. <clears throat> Students with FASD have ongoing problems with, with short-term memory, and they have inconsistent performance, a lot because of their memory problems. So they're going to forget things. They're going to forget things they knew. They're going to forget things that um, that they remembered before <laughs> and uh, that we think they should know. And they need to have a safe way that we just reteach it. We, re we just repeat it. We do it over. Um, and this is where we just develop through repetition. We start developing our learned patterns of behavior. Um, number four, routine. Um, the more we can make a student's life, the days basically the same, the easier it becomes because they have less things for their brain to try to figure out what's going to happen next. And what what I suggest is we start in, in we start in preschool and kinder, kindergarten. We start teaching habit patterns or learned behavior or routines that will keep them safe in adult life. And everything from manners, we just start the habit pattern. 
if it, that behavior would get them in trouble in adult life, we don't allow it in kindergarten or first grade. Simplicity. Um, a lot of you have heard me speak, have, have heard me tell the story of James in the lunchroom, who was one of the first students in Alaska I worked with in uh, seventh grade. And he had an IQ in the average range, um, lots of, uh, of behavior problems. Um, we wanted to send him out to a treatment program. But in most of his behavior, he'd been suspended 13 times and uh, from school. And most of the time, it was during the fall, and most of the time was for his behavior in the lunchroom. And, and basically, he, when I got talking with him, he told me that teachers in the lunchroom hated him, and he thought and he had some choice words to say about them. He was, this was a seventh grade boy. So I basically, I started thinking about it, and, um, you know, and he was obnoxious. I took him in the lunchroom by himself, and I asked him to show me where it was he was supposed to sit. And he had been able to tell me the exact rules, because the school has very precise rules for how, where you, what you do during lunch. And, um, <laughs> and so I took him in to have him show me what it was, to, to show me that he understood the rules or whatever. And you know what? He couldn't do it. He didn't know. And I was stunned. This kid that swore like a sailor and acted real tough really didn't understand the procedure for lunch. So I taught it to him, took some pictures, sent the pictures home with him, and um, didn't wasn't suspended. He was suspended two more times during that year, neither one for lunch. Be very specific. Say exactly what you want. I had a, uh, a high school student who had was attending a vocational program, and he refused to go the last day. And uh, <clears throat> he had done really well. He was going to get an A, pass the vocation uh, training, and he refused to go the, his last day to show up to work. And when his parents sat him down and said, what in the world? And he said that he was embarrassed to go because the teacher had said he was to go up until the 14th of April. Well, it was that meant he went up through the 13th, he thought. And he thought if he showed up on the 14th, he would be embarrassed and laugh at him. He, so be very specific with your words. I had another student one time that um, she could read. It was a first grade student and she could read. But she wouldn't read until when the teacher told her to read. And I was observing in the classroom and the teacher said, OK, now you read. And she just sat there. And they thought she was being uh, oppositional. And I w went over to her and I said, honey, um, do you know what the word read means? And she kind of looked at me and I said, when you read, when someone asks you to read, it means start saying the words. And she went, oh. <laughs> so sometimes the answers are that simple. You're going to just fall more in love with students with FASD the more we realize it's their naivete and their innocence that gets them in so much trouble. Number seven, structure. We um, structure anytime they're having a hard time, step back, observe, find out what it is they need to, to be able to do and help them through a dot-to-dot -dot process provide the structure. And sometimes people say, well, I can't provide level of structure. Um, I have too many students or whatever. But we do it in simple ways. There was a, a brilliant. A second grade teacher in um, Ontario, in Canada, who I was observing her in a remote area. And she said it was time for the kids. You know, often at recess, when the bell rings, the students, um, the neurotypical kids, know the bell's about ready to ring because they feel time passing. And uh, they're lined up right away. And often our students with FASD are off on the playground unaware because often they can't feel time passing and that's a brain thing again that so we have how can we structure them lining up on time without just getting them in trouble okay well you can remind them you can um, those kinds of things but this brilliant teacher a little before the bell rang she put on at that time she had a a, a, a boom box and she had recorded the song, the more we get together, 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 
and that childhood song, the more we get together, the happier we'll be. And she would play that, and the student would play it would play on a loud on, throughout the playground, and the kids would have all the kids would start getting ready to come line up, and then the bell would ring. So there's ways to provide structure that aren't going to hurt anyone else. They're simple. It won't be more. It's not more work. It's just doing it a little differently. And number eight is uh, supervision. And again, students with FASD uh, need ongoing supervision more than other typical other students of their same age, because we need to see where their stuck parts in their thinking are. We need to help again correct the learn the learned behaviors so that they can develop behaviors for success in adult life. Supervision is really important. And Sister Suzette, who a lot of you know who's done amazing things uh, with uh, students with FASD, added one to my eight magic keys. And it's a really important one. So she said she added a master key, which is a trusting relationship. And of course, relationship and trust is the basis for all the other keys. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a story, and a lot some of you know this person. But there was a Clickit Indian boy, baby boy, born in a remote area of Alaska. His mother at the time uh, was late stage alcoholic, and he had many episodes of abuse and neglect in his early years. And his plight was um, really not caught by OCS or by the school system on the level that they were able to really intervene. And because of his situation, he was, he was not homeless, but in, basically in a lot of ways he was. He didn't want to go home. He uh, wasn't getting help at school. He was um, really, really going down the wrong path. He would rage at school. He, uh, yeah, would avoid going home. So. And his grandparents were able to intervene. He went to live with them at the age of 13, and they helped turn things around. And this is what they did. They, did, they taught him about his heritage. They taught him about, um, they used basically the eight magic keys. They simplified his life. And two years ago, this clinket baby boy was an intern at the White House. He has full fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. He has full fetal alcohol syndrome. We are seeing many more outcomes when people put these structures in place. So Andy, I think I actually got it on time. <laughs> I think that, that um, through all of us working together, that what we are doing is creating a future by helping those who have FASD in our school system. We're helping to stop the next generation from having fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And so we are working together to build a future without this, these horrible disabilities. So I thank all of you for your uh, time. And if we have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great. Thanks, Deb Evenson. That was a great presentation, a lot of really useful information. Uh, this is Andy Catcher again uh, at NOFAS. And uh, as Deb mentioned, i uh, just like to uh, mention again the uh, 8 Magic Keys, a DVD of a video of the 8 Magic Keys is available on the NOFAS website. So if you just go to our website, uh, nofast.org, and in the main navigation bar at the top, um, there's a button that says Resources. And if you click on that, if you go under that, uh, you can click Order NOFAS Materials, and then you can order a DVD there for uh, the 8 Magic Keys uh, video. So, yeah, we do have uh, several questions uh, that came in, and uh, we should have time for some more if some people want to uh, type any additional questions at this time. Uh, feel free to go ahead. So I'll just ask uh, one of the questions we got. Uh, the person asks, how can you tell if a child has FASD or if they are just violent and aggressive uh, before they've been diagnosed? Uh, this person um, has worked with a child that was aggressive towards other children, staff and parents, and had delays in uh, language, social, mm -hmm. uh, cognitive, and gross motor development? Mm -hmm. Well, what, what I say is, of course, in, in school, of course, we don't, um, we're not diagnostic, we're not, we don't diagnose cancer, we don't diagnose, um, uh, you know, other, other birth defect syndromes. And we don't die because we're not we're not doctors, we're not medical people, so we don't diagnose FASD. 
but we can tell when a child has a cognitive difference. And a, neuro, a cognitive difference then or a cognitive problems or having problems with thinking, then we know that often that's how we get a parent to take the child for a, a diagnosis. We don't know what it is, but we know there's something. If we get them to the right person, they'll diagnose it, whether it's FASD or something else. And what I say, when I'm working with students, um, are going to, to help with a problem with, with students, if typical behavior approaches have worked, okay, then that, that would lead me to think that they're probably not fetal alcohol. But the children where we've tried those kinds of things, and people that know what they're doing have tried those strategies, and they're not working, then, then there's something else going on. Because in our, in our behavior uh, field, we've learned a lot. We can change behaviors. But the kids, in fact, that's what got me started on this, on the field of fetal alcohol, is that, that I was doing a demonstration on how to get a first grader to behave in a classroom. Uh, and I went into a classroom in the very far north of Alaska. <laughs> and um, did, was using my strategies that always work, or almost always work when you do them right, and they didn't work. And I spent a long time trying to figure out what was going on with the student and realized he'd been prenatally exposed to alcohol and we helped him get a diagnosis. So if the typical behaviors work, or the typical strategies work, then go for it. If they're not working, there's something else going on. And it's fetal alcohol or it's another cognitive problem or it's incredible trauma that's happening in the child's life, there's something else going on. So we step back, we observe, and we start seeing what else we can, you know, find out. Okay. Great. That, did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question somebody was asking, um, if you can give some strategies for encouraging a student to apply themselves beyond the minimum effort. So they were saying that uh, this person's child is in a special needs class and Okay. Uh, put forth extra effort to show what they're fully capable of. Okay. Well, they might already. Now, let's go back here to to um, <clears throat> to this brain that we've been talking about, and remember their their brain. What might look like minimum effort might be the child's full effort. And so I, I'm always I'm pretty I'm pretty careful about. Uh, you know, kind of determining how hard a child's working, because often a child with FASD's brain is working so much harder, it just doesn't show. And so just remember how hard their brain has to work to accomplish just the things we were talking about today, just a pencil, a, 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 a pencil and paper task in class, or a, whether it's a special needs class or a typical class. And I think that's something that I've learned from observing so many hundreds of students in so many different settings, is it, it breaks my heart when you really get a chance to observe and you see how hard their brain is working and how little it shows. So I would assume they're, they're already working hard. And I would start, I would start um, uh, praising them for what they're doing at this point. I, one of my strongest beliefs in life, after all these millions, so many years teaching, is this statement, children always do their best. I don't know of a child who purposely tries to, and this is a whole, this is a whole other presentation really, but, but like all of us, on a daily basis, we kind of do the best we're, we, we can do, depending on whether we have a headache, whether somebody said something mean to us and we got our feelings hurt. Or what? So um, children always do that. Yeah, go ahead. All right, great, thank you. And another person is asking, what's what is the best way to implement the eight magic keys for a 13-year-old that has just been diagnosed with an FASD? Um, okay, well, first of all, the if I don't know if I'm talking to the parent or the uh, teacher, um, but um, I would help the child understand. Of course, if if the teacher would have to be with parents the parents would need to be doing this and being involved with this. But I would help the child, make sure the child understands his or her disability. 
and so that's that's really important um, that they're not they're not a, a bad kid they have a problem and their brain works a little differently and we're going to show them we're going to help them be able to to um, to do well and they're going to be they're going to be fine and we're going to we're working with them and then I would just start looking through their day and going through and saying okay how can we make it more consistent how can we uh, make r routine how can things be more uh, specific we structure their day I just start looking at everything that's going on and trying to add more structure and support throughout the day and I'm really glad the child just got a diagnosis because that that can make the difference in their whole life great thank you uh, and another question is, are there any trainings available for teachers to help them to learn to work with youth with FASD in their schools? Um, well, um, there's, there's some of us that do that, that do trainings for uh, school districts, and I, that's, that's what I do, is uh, working with, and so you can, you can contact NOFAS, you can contact me, I can help uh, find people in your area that know about FASD who are teachers. Um, and Andy, you might help me with that if you know of something that's going on in your area that I don't know about. Great, yeah, so NOFAS has a calendar of events um, on our website and also in the, in the NOFAS Weekly Roundup we have a list of events and if people mm -hmm. send us stuff we'll definitely pass that along as far as training. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. NOFAS staff, Kathy Mitchell, the Vice President Spokesperson NOFAS, uh, goes around, travels, does a lot of trainings as well. So yeah, if you, you just contact NOFAS or contact Deb Evenson, we'll send you more information on that. Yeah. And another, we have, couple, uh, sorry. we have a couple of school districts up here in Alaska that have taken on the, appro the, um, the task of increasing the capacity to deal with students with FASD in every grade level and every program. And it's pretty exciting, some of the things that are happening. So I'm pretty excited about what we can do as teachers to make a difference. Thank you for that question. Great, thank you. And um, somebody had a question about medication, and um, they were saying in their experience, a lot of times schools seem to be quick to putting kids on medications, and w asking your thoughts about that. <laughs> I see. I have really strong feelings about that. Uh, school teachers are not doctors, and we don't put kids on diabetes medication, and we don't put kids on cancer medication. And I, I think they basically have no business in the medication field. We're not doctors. We deal with the students as they come to us, and we help provide support for parents and information if the parents want to seek a medical diagnosis or medication. So I just kind of, and I think sometimes as, as educators, we jump to those conclusions because we don't know what else to do. And so we think there's nothing we can change, there's nothing else we can do, and so, well, maybe the child can get some medication, and that'll make them be able to do this. You can't medicate away fetal alcohol. We might be able to give a medication that might help them be less distractible, or if the doctor understands FASD, and so there might be some of those things they might that sometimes work, but they're still going to be have a developmental age of half or less their age. They're still going to have memory issues. They're still going to have trouble understanding the deeper meaning of the school rules and figuring out what to do in new situations. So, so it's really not going to medicate things away like, you know, the school would, wishes it would when, when it recommends it. Great. <laughs> Uh, and another person is asking about what, what the best way is to prepare a student with FASD for a change in the daily classroom routine, like an assembly or a change in plans, uh, starts to rain, oh. recess, some oh. things like that. Good okay. question. And I, again, it uh, depends on the situation. And you, the teacher might figure out many better things than I can think of just off the top of my head. But I would practice ahead of time. And I would say, you know, I would actually practice the routine. When this happens, this is what we do. And so um, if we have, um, we're going to have a surprise assembly. I, I might practice with the student what to do and even have a card. This is a surprise assembly. Remember, we practice what to do for this day. Um, so uh, that's what I do. I think practicing is really good and having, um, again, having a routine that they can get help in and the, the supervision 
to this is this is what we prepared for. It's okay. Great, so, thank you. Um, and you this will probably be one of the last questions, just in terms of for time. Okay. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to email um, the presenter, Deb Evenson, some of the questions that we didn't have time for, and she'll reach out to respond to some of those people um, individually. Um, so one of the last questions, so somebody was asking that they see meltdowns and sudden mood changes um, mm -hmm. with their uh, child with FASD, likely due to overstimulation, frustration. And they're asking, aside from the eight magic keys and uh, strategies like deep breathing, sensory strategies, is there anything else that they can do to prevent or reduce that? Uh, I think sensory <laughs> strategies and keeping the environment very simple and teaching the child how to calm their own body down. Absolutely, is uh, all those things are excellent. Absolutely, and uh, so I would um, uh, I would look at sense, I would look at all of those and there's a lot of information out there on calming techniques and things like that. Absolutely, I would teach the child those things. And the other thing is we, we as educators and as parents both we need to be able to see when the child is starting to get frustrated and like I know that this sounds for the busy teacher this sounds I can hear teachers <laughs> going yeah right I've got 30 kids in my class but once you start recognizing it it's actually not that hard it'll make your days easier so we, we start trying to avoid it by on the very first stages of stress we turn it down we turn it around then and so we, what we want to do is avoid, avoid the meltdowns. Oh, this is something really important I want to say, that I forgot to say today. Um, when a child, like our, the child that I was talking about that was so violent, when, um, we, when we got his behavior down to zero, okay, his violent, his acting out down to zero, then that's the level of support we keep. We don't then start fading away the support. Any more than we would fade away a support from a blind child who had learned to read using Braille. We don't then start taking the Braille away. For a child with FASD, when their behavior stabilizes, the meltdowns go away, we keep it there. That's what success looks like for a child with FASD. I was just in a wonderful class in um, a school, I'm going to say the name of the school because it was so amazing, Ravenwood Elementary in Eagle River, Alaska. And I walked in that classroom, and it was a regular classroom, and I watched a student with an FASD uh, behave, you know, I, I watched him go through the day, and he was doing really well. You could tell he, had, he has a disability. All of us would, would notice that, but he was doing really well. And I said to the teacher, I said, I wish I'd had a camera because this is what success looks like at this age. So once we get it there, we keep, and they were starting to talk about maybe we start taking away some of the supports now. And I said, no, we leave them right there. And that's why we need the whole system to understand fetal alcohol, so that we understand that we keep the supports there once we get the behavior set to stabilize. Great. Thank you very much. And um, sort of in closing, somebody was asking um, if you're interested in sharing any sort of contact information for yourself or any sort of uh, other information you'd like to share for people that want to follow up uh, information or to, to uh, contact you. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, uh, my name is Debbie Evenson, and um, my, I'm just, <laughs> my uh, email address is Deb Evenson, D-E-B-E-V-E-N-S-E. E N all E's at Alaska spelled out dot net and my cell phone and you can text me is nine zero seven three nine nine eight nine zero zero that's nine zero seven three nine nine eight nine zero zero great thank you. you mind just maybe repeating that email address one more time oh yes Deb Evenson at Alaska dot net okay great thank you very much. All right. Well, we there were uh, some additional questions we didn't have time for, uh, as it's about a little uh, three o'clock now. So I'm going to send those to the presenter, Deb Evenson, to respond to them uh, directly. And thank you very much. Uh, it was a great presentation, a lot of really useful information. Again, you can get more information on the NoFast website. 
uh, nofast.org. You can order the DVD of A Magic Keys. There's also a page on the NoFast website for education in FASD. Uh, if you go to nofast.org and there's a tab that says resources, and then if you go down to education and FASD, uh, there's more information on the NoFast webpage um, in terms of uh, K through 12 curriculum that NoFast developed and other resources, a lot of brochures, information um, for strategies for students with FASD and so on. So you can go there for more information. And I uh, definitely feel free to contact NoFast. You can go to our website and go to the contact us section and contact Deb Evenson directly if you'd like. So thank you very much. And, yeah. and Andy, Andy can I say something? Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I just want to say, you know, through my through my years of observing uh, student um, observing teachers, I just want to say that I know that there are amazing teachers out there that um, we're dealing with things that we were not trained to deal with, and I just want to thank all of you who are on this on uh, this webcast. <laughs> And this webinar, I, I really appreciate all of you parents and teachers and professionals working with these kids. I know that they're, you're amazing people out there, and I'm honored to talk with you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.